Today I want to talk about the integration of learning, formation, and practice, which we do here at Beeson Divinity School. It's what I call the preaching life. The preaching life. Now this is not original with me. I stole it from St. Augustine. Uh, he, he spent uh, more than 25 years writing a treatise or handbook for preachers. The title is De Doctrina Christiana on teaching on Christian teaching or teaching Christianity. The Latin could be taken in either way. And it's interesting that he doesn't begin with preaching. He starts with the church's Trinitarian confession of faith, its way of life, the significance of scripture, the interpretation of scripture, communicating the truths of scripture in preaching and teaching, and then finally at the very end he talks about the person who is the preacher. And this is what he says. When it's all said and done, the pastor must be a person who prays, a prayer who is becoming a living sermon. Okay? So, given that Tuesday was Finkenval today, I can't think of anyone better to offer a, a brief snapshot of the preaching life than Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer's commitment to reading scripture theologically, a way of listening to God speaking in the present, refused to privilege the historical situation of Nazi Germany. A hermeneutic which had re relegated the Bible to an ancient text which needs to be contemporized or made relevant to fit modern sensibilities and demands. Bonhoeffer's interpretation of scripture and preaching was informed by Christian doctrine and Lutheran confessions, thus providing a vision of reality which was not limited to a separate realm identified as religion, which could be marginalized and thus co-opted by the Nazi state. Bonhoeffer's work with preaching remained focused on the reign of God, God's reign over all that is, revealed and established in the weakness and humility of Jesus Christ, the incarnate, crucified, and risen Lord, who is himself the true measure of a preacher's life and speech, the preaching life. An important work by Bonhoeffer during the early war years in Germany, 1939 and 40, is Prayer Book of the Bible the last of his books to be published during his lifetime. Bonhoeffer's short primer on prayer as central to both the life and work of preachers, the preaching life, is often overlooked and even dismissed as the product of an earlier stage of thought, which is surpassed by his later work. Compared with the depth of historical, philosophical, and theological reflection that comprises ethics, and the provocative reflections of letters and papers from prison, prayer book of the Bible is too easily categorized as a devotional or spiritual piece of writing. However, I would say that prayer book of the Bible is best read as a prophetic work, written to assist confessing church pastors to proclaim the way of God revealed in Scripture, a way that is received and lived in following after Jesus Christ who speaks today through the Psalms of Israel. I mean, can you imagine anything more radical in, in the mid, at the height of, of Nazi Germany that you're going to teach out of the Psalms of Israel? Mm. Bonhoeffer understood, this, understood the way of God as revealed and entered into through prayer. He writes, <clears throat> finding the way to speaking with God, no one can do that on one's, own own, on one's own, for that one needs Jesus Christ. You see, Bonhoeffer doesn't assume prayer is a natural activity, but is learned by hearing and speaking God's word. The way which is from God is summed up in Jesus Christ, while the way of humanity which is to God is also Jesus Christ. He writes, so we learn to speak to God because he's, he has spoken and speaks to us. We ought to speak to God, and God wishes to hear us, not in the false, confused language of our heart, but in the clear, pure language that God has spoken to us in Jesus Christ. God's speech in Jesus Christ meets us in the Holy Scriptures. 
Bonhoeffer compared learning the language of prayer or God's speech with a child learning to speak by listening to her parents. Christian people learn God's speech, which is the language of faith, and names the reality of God in the world. They do this by learning to pray with Christ, who is the Word of the Father. The true teacher of prayer, God's speech, is Christ, the Son of God. Bonhoeffer says, He who has brought before God every need, every joy, every thanksgiving, and every hope of humankind. Prayer is nothing less than Jesus Christ, the incarnate Word who prays in, with, and for God's people. He says in Jesus' mouth the human Word becomes God's Word. When we pray along with the prayer of Christ, God's Word becomes again a human Word. Bonhoeffer's reflection on prayer as central to Christian faith, life, and ministry is consistent with his insistence that Christ and the church cannot be divided. Prayer, particularly the Psalms, the prayer book of the Bible, is first and foremost about Christ. The Psalms are God's Word spoken by Christ, and only then God's Word spoken by the church. Praying the Psalms in the name of Christ is a way of standing by the Word, God has spoken in the Psalms of Israel. Moreover, the Word of God, incarnate in Jesus Christ, stands by the church in all of its fears, weakness, sufferings, and even its death. To pray the Psalms is to follow the path or way which God has made in Christ, who is present with the church today, alive, risen, enjoying blessings, suffering, and even crucified anew. For Bonhoeffer, then, the Psalms provide a mirror of the church's life and being joined to Christ for the sake of the world. He writes, therefore, it is the prayer of the human nature assumed by Christ that comes before God here. It is really our prayer. But since the Son of God knows us better than we know ourselves and was truly human for our sake, it is also really the Son's prayer. It can become our prayer only because it is first his prayer. For Bonhoeffer, the language of preaching is tested and purified by the language of prayer, since learning to speak to God is necessary in order to speak of God. Bonhoeffer's meditation on the Psalms provides a primer for preachers, what I would call a grammar of the language of faith a way of perceiving and living and speaking in accord with reality within the communion of the Father and the Son. Just as prayer does not come naturally, neither does preaching come naturally. Rather, it must be learned by acquiring the clear, pure language which God speaks in Christ to reveal the truth of all that is. Preaching, then, which is inseparable from praying, is given theological meaning in light of God, who is Creator and Redeemer. For Bonhoeffer, praying, preaching, and living are inseparably bound together in Jesus Christ. The Word of God is the way from God and to God, the path which has been completed by the incarnate, crucified, risen Lord. Bonhoeffer's prayer book of the Bible thus sets forth the scope of the Word in the various types of psalms. He lists creation, the law, the history of salvation, the Messiah, the church, life, suffering, guilt, enemies, and the end. His meditation on the psalms depicts a journey of faith, a way in which Christians follow the way of Jesus Christ through the whole of life. Thus the whole of Christian life is prayer, the way to God which is provided in Christ and the church's answer to God in Christ, which it speaks with its words and by its actions. Bonhoeffer thus emphasizes the repetitious nature of praying the Psalms, which is highlighted by Psalm 119, his favorite of all, to such a degree that it seems so simple that it is virtually impervious to our exegetical analysis. It is there not a suggestion that every word of prayer must penetrate to a depth of the heart which be reached only by unceasing repetition. The repetition of Psalm 119 then is a way of praying which forms one for hearing, speaking, and following after the Word of God. 
Bonhoeffer says, an unbroken, indeed continuous process of learning, appreciation, appropriation, and impressing God's will in Jesus Christ on the mind and heart. Bonhoeffer's interpretation of Psalm 119 articulates a vision which draws together prayer, scriptural meditation, and study, preaching of the place of the church in the world. His reading of Psalm 119 is congruent with the message of the psalm, that God provides a way for His people to become a visible sign of Christ's presence and activity in the world. In late 1939, he wrote a liturgy for Christmas, which has been preserved in fragmentary form. This brief act of prayer points to the Christological vision which guided Bonhoeffer's interpretation of the Psalms within the relation of the church's worship, doctrine, preaching, and life. He writes, Lord, God of all peace and love, you have come to us so that we should come to you. You became human so that we would become godly. In grace you took on flesh and blood so that we might partake of you. Through your most holy birth, may we be born anew in peace and love, and turn us, poor sinners, into children of your mercy. Bonhoeffer begins his meditation on Psalm 119 with a theological conviction that the beginning has already happened. The life of the church today is not continually remade or begun anew but as a path to be followed within God's forgiving and renewing Word in Christ, the work God has accomplished in baptism, rebirth, and conversion. There is what he calls a joyful certainty of faith in which the church is called to walk the path of God who continually seeks after his people. Bonhoeffer saw the confessing church, its pastors and preachers, is following the path of the psalmist as the way of God's grace and faith. The church is always tempted to return to the beginning, to search for something new and creative, which is the same as turning back to itself and choosing to live under the weight of the law. To do so, says Bonhoeffer, is to deny the gift of God who has already given the law, decrees, statutes, and commandments as God's act of redemption and God's promise, which are confirmed by the narrative of salvation. He writes, We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Whoever asks about the law will be reminded of Jesus Christ and the redemption from servitude and sin and death that in Him has been accomplished for all human beings and will be revealed of the new beginning set by God in Jesus Christ for all human beings. The way of God's law leads to God Himself and God alone. Moreover, the testimonies of those who seek God with all their hearts are signposts, reminders, lest God's people lose their way. And this way has been tested. It's the path walked and prepared by God Himself. Bonhoeffer affirms the surpassing value of this journey is not merely marking time, but as a movement led by God who knows the entire way, even though the church only knows the next step and anticipates attaining the final goal or end. Moreover, the reality of God's faithful action and guidance has profound implications for understanding the nature of the preacher's life and work. He writes, the entire gospel message of salvation can be called simply the way or the way of God. In this way, it becomes clear that the gospel and faith are not a timeless idea, but an action of God and of the human being in history. God's path is made visible by those who follow the way of God to human beings, which is also the way of human beings to God. He writes, the way of God is not abstract doctrine, a plan, a program, or a principle. It has a name, Jesus Christ. The way of God in Christ requires diligence in keeping God's commandments that point to the one who commands. And the commands of God provide direction, purpose, and a goal. They're not ends in themselves, nor obey for themselves, but rather for God. Bonhoeffer says, God who wants to enter us deeply and wants to be held fast in every condition of life. 
focus of proclaiming God's way, then, is neither the self nor one's own plans, intentions, failures, or wanderings. Bonhoeffer viewed such self-referential preaching, which calls attention to the preacher, as an obstacle preventing the church from hearing and receiving the pure, clear path provided by God. He notes that too often our prayer begins with ourselves. The challenge in preaching, then, is not to seek on our own a better or straighter path, since God's statutes already contain the way of all that is. He calls, he says, the course of heaven and earth and humankind has been irrevocably prescribed by these statutes. The call is to enter God's firmness and faithfulness. The necessity of preaching is given in the way of the Psalter, since there is no situation in which God's word cannot provide direction. He writes, but serious attention, tireless asking, and learning are necessary to recognize the right commandment and to recognize the inexhaustible kindness of God in all His commands. Gratitude is therefore a sign of such attentiveness as listening and learning, thankful praise and obedience, and this are united in the proclamation of the Word. Psalm 119, therefore, offers a hermeneutic of thankful praise, which is the way of learning God's commands with an upright heart. Gratitude and thankfulness is a way of looking back to God who gives, as well as a looking forward in hope to God who commands, a way of living out of the past and into the future, which seeks to discern God's righteousness in the present. Because God speaks out of divine abundance to human poverty, preaching is a way of speaking which precludes our prideful arrogance that presumes upon God's goodness and God's gifts. Bonhoeffer notes that it is the Holy Spirit who instructs and transforms the heart to desire God's way. The grace of God works the transformation of the heart creating a new beginning which comes in Christ through word and sacrament. The Holy Spirit then grants faith which gladly acknowledges, I want, I desire, in a quite new and different way. Filled with the Spirit, a preacher desires God's will and cooperates with God's way as given in God's word. To live and speak by faith in the Spirit's power is to acknowledge our own weakness, a kind of blamelessness which does not consist of our good intentions, ideals, hard work, or fulfillment of our duties. Such blamelessness is the fruit of God's forgiveness rather than our self-satisfaction. The Word of God then for Bonhoeffer is received as a gift rather than a possession and he offers a beautiful summary of this homiletical truth. The clearer and deeper God's Word shows itself to us, the more vivid the desire in us becomes for the consummate clarity and inexhaustible depth of God. Through the gift of His Word, God drives us to seek ever richer knowledge and an ever more glorious gift. He does not like false contentment. The more we receive, the more we learn to seek God, and the more we seek, the more we will receive from Him. God wants to be fully glorified in us and revealed in all His abundance. Certainly, we can never seek God anywhere else but in His Word. But this Word is alive and inexhaustible, for God Himself lives in it. Bonhoeffer calls this the joy of preaching the grand word without which there is no walking in the way of the Lord. And he says, God's word creates joy in the one who takes it in. Bonhoeffer summarized the wisdom of Psalm 119 for preaching. Hearing God's word takes time and maturity, pondering and reflecting, silence and contemplation. He writes, God's word claims my time. God's word entered time and wants me to give him my time. Discerning and doing God's will is a daily task, 
since God's new word is received and expounded through a never-ending wealth of interpretation that will always exceed our grasp. Bonhoeffer opposed the reduction of preaching to abstract principles, rules, and topics derived from Scripture which can be applied without prayerful consideration, without taking Scripture into the heart, without involving one's whole self in faithful obedience to what is heard and spoken. Preaching moral rules and values prevents the work of exegesis. Prayer and thoughtful study which enable recognition of God's Word in Scripture as God's speech. Preachers then who do not practice meditation and exegesis deny their office and calling, since prayerful reading and thoughtful study require each other. Bonhoeffer, Bonhoeffer's meditation ends with a challenge to pastors called to preach. He writes, can we speak this word without knowing that it is directed to us? Bonhoeffer's meditation on Psalm 119 provides a good picture of his commitment to listening to, speaking from, and living by the Bible and the concrete reality of the world. Preachers must stay close to Scripture and to life allowing neither one to command, command their full attention to the exclusion of the other. The importance of meditation is not merely hearing and obeying God's command, but rather hearing and obeying the present Christ, who fulfills God's law and speaks God's commandment in particular times, places, and circumstances. Bonhoeffer's meditation is a model of moral discernment and accountability for hearing the voice of Christ and responding in faithful and fitting ways that are accountable and responsible. Reading scripture then for the church is a spiritual, intellectual, and embodied exercise by which one is conformed to the person of Christ and attuned to hearing God's word in Christ. And although prayer is central, it cannot be separated from the intellect. Both meditation and serious study are equally important for the work of preaching, which seeks to hear, speak, and follow the way of God in the present. Bonhoeffer's commentary on Psalm 119, his favorite psalm of all, exemplifies what I would call a particular ethos, a character of preaching a way of being, thinking, speaking, and living, which is generated out of prayerful attentiveness to and reflection on the Word of God. The whole person, the women and men who are called and claimed for the preaching life. 